of international rugby league like this was you sort of built central. as. I think having them all in the same location is isn't a bad idea, but yeah. we, they certainly should be looking to engage mm. out there in, in the islands and what not. Yeah, there you go. No. Nope. Uh, Bernard had loads to say after the car, like always. He did, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Bernard. Always good to hear from you. I agree with most of his points. Yeah. Some of them are a little bit further along the, the scale as, as we get. Yeah. Basically, I agree with a moderate version of most of his points. <laughs> you're, the to- you're the Tony Blair of Bernard's Arthur Scargill points, then, is that what we're saying? <laughs> Don't call me Tony Blair. <laughs> I knew that I'd get, I knew that I'd get a response. Um, Fat Boy Rob. Speaking of politics, really, really briefly, my brother-in-law Michael stood for the Green Party in the county council elections in Fleetwood last week and came a very creditable third. Yeah, they picked up um, good numbers mm. and still no coverage on the incredulously right-wing bias uh, national media. Yes. Um, but I'm sure there's lots of listeners who appreciate that and side with those sorts of parties. So, you know, everyone vote for who they want to vote for and we'll not use this as too much of a political platform. No, I just wanted to make a just don't follow our uh, individual Twitter. I just, want, I, just want, I just wanted to make the point and then and then draw attention to my brother-in-law's homemade rosette that my sister did for wow. me. Which I think was the highlight, really. Uh, Fatboy Rob got in touch with his mark. Said, what's the view on the Magic superhero strips? Personally, I think they look pretty good. Yeah, yeah, I thought they looked pretty good on all the Australian teams that they got designed for and we've just whacked the badges on, essentially. I'm not a massive fan, to be perfectly honest with you. I think they've selected okay with the teams yeah, they've that been. they've allocated the different shirts yeah. to. And, uh, and yeah, they're, they're the same designs we've seen for the last three years, so they work. Yes, they do. Yeah. I prefer the charity shirts, to be honest. If there's going to be, you know, and, and raise a bit of money. And do things that way. I liked it when when teams like Witness did a charity shirt and and, and stuff like that. I would have preferred that. But from a there's no of scope it, for money to go to charity. I'm not entirely it? sure, and I I'm, I'm happy to have that pointed out yeah. to me. And if so, I'll, I'll retract what I've said. But I prefer the uh, the charity shirts for it. And I've yet to see anything that does say that those Marvel shirts are for charity. But that could just be me missing something. And if that's the case, then please let me know. Yep. Okay. Where are we at? Daniel Hull got in touch with an email. Um, he said, Hi guys, wondered what your thoughts were on the fan research Salford have announced this week. Do you think it's the first stage of trying to rebrand us Manchester? There seems to be lots of rumours about a name change at the moment. I think doing the research is a good thing to try and get more fans involved with trying to grow the club. The attendances are just not good enough really and the club needs to be self-sustainable. However, I don't really see how changing the name will increase fans. I think it's more about marketing the club and the game to a wider audience. The marketing seems to be aimed around the Salford area, but there's a large area around Manchester or Greater Manchester that I think should be tapped into. People moan about the stadium being inaccessible, but it's across the road from the Trafford Centre, which is one of the most visited places in the UK. Wondered if you had any thoughts at all. Dan, P.S. Enjoyed listening to last week's podcast, Running Round the Fjords in Norway. Like a Norwegian blue, we was pining for the fjords. Um... I have my own very tinfoil hatty conspiracy theory about Salford, um, which I won't share with you now because you'll poke loads and loads and no, loads. No, share it. And loads I, won't even and I won't even go into loads it. Loads and loads and loads of holes about it. Was it what happened with Gateshead and Hull and all that crack years ago? So they merged yeah. and then they split. I think. And Gateshead start again. Same as Huddersfield and Sheffield broadly. I think the RFL are keeping Bradford on life support, essentially for there to be a coming together, which will see the first team at Salford largely transplanted into Bradford. Bradford will retain its youth setup, and the, the players that are there now will go into some sort of reserve system, and Salford will rise right. again as Manchester Rangers in League One. That's my tinfoil hat theory. Now, you're not allowed to poke holes in it, because you said I'm you I'm not. I'm not going to poke any holes in something <laughs> that's clearly utter <laughs> fucking bullshit. Um, but... <laughs> Yeah, I don't get the point of a Manchester name change. They're, like no. you say, there are the Manchester Rangers who are, are making a serious bid to yeah, try and get involved in League One. Um, and there are also like the Mancunians. Mm-hmm. Um, then there's all the other greater Manchester teams as well in the structure. I mean, Swinton fans still fucking hate Salford. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like Hunslet and Link. Leeds, but obviously slightly less removed because there is a potential that these two sides... Maybe. They're not as far apart yeah. at the moment, but um, 
I don't see the I don't see the value in it because you you piss off enough of an existing fan base mm. trying to draw in a fan base that you don't even know if it exists because it's certainly not shown up yet. Yeah. So I don't get that. I think there's lots of fans are really passionate and really doing a lot of work. There's the devil in the detail guys. We know yeah. what they got. There's our mate Willows Road who's really trying to support the club with their posh Big in time. terms of getting finding people as like champions almost mm. for each of the re, the community areas around Salford and getting leafling done doors to doors done whatever what have you mm-hmm. um, and I think it's a really great undertaking for Salford to do it I hope they're doing it with a clean slate and not an agenda Yeah, but I don't think the Salford fans will believe that even if they were told that straight in the face yeah. Um, but yeah I, what I can't answer is why they don't get the six and a half thousand they were able to get regularly in the Super League era at the Willows, six and a half, seven and a half thousand. Yeah. Um, when it's not that hard to get to. No. It's a little bit harder for someone who lived within walking distance of the Willows to get to because they have to get on a fucking bus. Yeah. But, in all seriousness... I love how you assume that they all need a bus and they don't have cars. <laughs> No, but you know what I mean. You have to walk to the bus stop and yeah. get on a bus if you want to go and have your beers or whatever. Or if you don't want to deal with the shitstorm that is that car park, mm-hmm. because the car park is poor, is poorly laid out. Yes, the, planning, the, the, planning the on system that on that doesn't seem to work. No. But if you go and park at the aerodrome and there's nothing else going on anywhere else that day, you get mm. out dead quick, quick sharpish. I'm home always within an hour. Um, yeah, from from leaving the stadium yeah. and. I, I don't get the I don't get the moans. I don't get why people use that as a reason. I think it's bullshit, and people mm. need to be called out on that bullshit. But you can't call them out because you have to pander to them because you need them to come back. Yeah. So I, I just don't get why it's not working. But maybe a, a Wembley appearance or something might kickstart it. I don't well, know. But well, this think, sort of stuff is at least trying to engage with their fans, and I don't know how much they've tried to engage with the fans. Uh, before now in the recent past mm. look more recently look this season the on field product is better than it has been in recent years as well so you would ex- well let's not forget they were in the top four at Easter last year as well yeah no, that's true I still think they played better they played, I think they played better and more consistently this year than they did last more year more consistently yeah so you know maybe that will contribute and they've beaten the, big, gradually they've beaten the better teams well. haven't they yes well. they have yeah, yeah absolutely right who's the next last who's the final person to get in touch uh, Alan Walker at, oh we've already done that he sent us a DM on Twitter to say uh, to ask me but I, <clears> I don't know you can ask us both because I don't have an answer for him he said are there more injuries in the game seems more players are missing even though even they've banned even though they've banned the Biff shoulder charge charges, spear tackles, clotheslines and other crowd pleasers. <laughs> no, seriously, is the game getting too fast or too tough? They're not on the source after games anymore. It's recuperation and stuff. Some clubs have many players out like the Dragons or Wigan and Salford and Cass have none. It seems there must be a reason. I always think there's, a, there's an element of luck because I, I, I do genuinely feel like um, with the fact that players are fitter and bigger now than they ever have been that impact injuries have more of an effect so whilst we've removed what I'll call the crowd pleasers from the game and I'm you know I'm inclined to agree with you on some of that um, I still think that the, the, the physical impact and the physical endurance that's required and, and, and what you put your body through playing professional rugby league these days I think it does lead to more injuries and, and that's why teams work so hard on recuperation and work so hard on preserving their players um, because I just think it's a nature of the sport, it's an impact sport where people are getting bigger and stronger and faster. Yeah, yeah. Quantifiably, I think that's what leads to it. Well, and there's always the sort of, the more finely tuned you are, if a, if a part breaks sort of yeah. thing, it might take you more time to get it back up and run it, I don't know. Precisely, yeah, I think um, so, definitely. Yeah, there's, there's an element of that. Wigan, um, obviously... Have had lots of injuries. Last year it was in the forward packs more, and this year it's been in the backs more. And they've done full, full reviews of this sort of stuff mm. within the club. I don't know if it'd be a good idea for them to get someone from outside the club to come in and, and check over all of the medical staff patting themselves on the back, saying, "Yeah, no, it's fine. It's not our fault. It's just luck." But it does appear to be a lot of it is is just luck. Mm. Um, you know, you look at the jaw injuries we've picked up in the last three, two jaw injuries in the last three games. Well, yeah. they don't come about because of overtraining or certain training methods or that sort of thing. No. They come about because of luck. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the knee and ankle inj- injuries we pick up, people could argue, are they, are they training them too hard? 
and does that make them more susceptible to picking up an injury in games? Um, I really don't know, and someone out there listening might be able to know about yeah. about that. But a lot of these players that are out for Wigan are, are in-game injuries mm. and, and that sort of thing. And then there's freak ones, like Sam Tompkins was picked up outside of the field of play, outside of training. Yeah. Um, Tony Club with his kidney. And, and you know, I, so I know more in-depth about the Wigan ones. I've not tracked injuries, the amount of players out by injuries, the length of time the injuries are, because I just, you know, I have a day job and a wife. Um, but it does sort of feel that way, doesn't it, that there are more injuries. Maybe that's a recency bias type thing, because it's hard to, you, you know, you don't think back, do you? But there was a game when, do you remember there was a game when Wigan played Saints and Kevin Brown won the man of the match and... Oh, well, years ago, yeah. No, he didn't win the man of the match, but Steve said he'd buy him a watch anyway, That all that stuff. Well, Wigan had a shit ton of players out for injury then, and that yeah. was 15 years ago, 12 years ago. Mm. So... But I think twelve years ago falls within the banner of what we're talking about. I think you're talking. I think you need to compare the last fifteen, twenty years with the twenty years previous to that. I think that Kevin Brown situation and that game that you're referring to actually falls within the boundaries of the advanced sports science, the size of the lads, and things like that. Right. Personally. Yeah, it's an interesting question. If there's anyone out there who's into sports science and mm. that sort of stuff, then. We certainly would, have a think and, and drop us a line, yeah. Absolutely right. That's your feedback and shout outs taken care of. Let's take a look now at news from around the world of rugby league. Okay, Mark, so to the news then. And we'll start at the AJ Bell, uh, where Salford winger Justin Carney has been given an eight-match ban after being found guilty of racially abusing Toronto Wolfpack player Ryan Bailey. The 28-year-old was sent off by referee Jack Smith in the 26th minute of the Super League Club's Challenge Cup fifth round win on the 23rd of April. Carney had been handed a grade F charge, the most severe category of offence, and an eight-game suspension was the minimum Punishment Carney pleaded guilty to an abuse charge but contested its severity. He served the first game of his ban in the win over Witness on Sunday, meaning he'll miss a further seven games. Salford confirmed in a statement that Carney had pleaded guilty to a charge of misconduct for having given verbal abuse to an opposition player based on race slash colour. However, Salford said that he did not intend his words to be taken in a racial context. Justin is an Indigenous Australian who's proud of his Aboriginal heritage. He stands firm on the position that he is not, nor has he ever been a racist added the statement. Carney has also been given a £300 fine and is still subject to an internal investigation by his club. I've done it to you again. I've not like updated it when it's turned over a week from where I've copied and pasted the news article from. Oh. Haven't I? Sorry. Oh, a um, few people got in touch. Brian Davies said, Carney ban is the right one, but the RFL should review the guidelines to see if eight games for racist abuse abuse is harsh enough. Mm-hmm. Mark Butler said, Brett Ferris and Carney compete for my Super League pod. See you next Tuesday award of the year on a weekly basis. Yeah, no, I'd close the voting for that category now, to be honest, unless someone comes out and does something more reprehensible than that and I'm struggling to think of well, well Jake Emmett's on, on the on the ballot paper for me well yeah okay uh, yeah. Owen Hughes says Carney Band seems like he seems like he did it if it's true then in my opinion he should have a season ban and be sacked from Salford however much it affects our season don't want to be harsh but these guys are role models and need to act as such yeah I, say, I think Owen's hit the nail on the head there really well I don't Look, want to sound like, a, like an apologist or anything like that for this sort of stuff because I'm certainly not yeah but I don't think Justin Carney is a is a racist, and no, I, don't I don't think, think what he racist. said was intended to be, you know, racially aggravated in in any sort of way. I just think he's a bit thick and shouted the first abusive thing that came into his mind and didn't think of the consequences. Now, I'm I'm not one who likes to label sports people as role models. I think we've had this conversation. In the past, but I do get the point that they should behave better than what Justin Carney has yeah. behaved like here. Yeah, but I'd, I'd say a, a season-long ban and sacking probably would be a step too far. But a serious like dint in his wallet from mm. the club um, and the two months off, off, off from playing the game, I think are suitable punishments yeah. here. Maybe, maybe it would be harsh, but. Um, and not to rip the lid off the role models thing again. I take your point when I say to people that, look, if you're a grown man 
and you base your behaviour on the outburst of a sports person like Justin Carney or the actions of someone like Tyson Fury, for instance, who comes out with some pretty reprehensible shit or the stuff that Zach Hardacre was found guilty of saying, and you're an adult capable of making informed, educated decisions.